Rothschild's Fiddle, a short story by Anton Chekhov. The town was small, no better than a village, and it was inhabited almost entirely by old people who died so seldom that it was positively painful. In the hospital, and even in the prison, coffins were required very seldom. In one word, business was bad. If Jakob Ivanov had been coffin maker in the government town, he would probably have owned his own house and called himself Jakob Matvyej. But, as it was, he was known only by the name of Jakob, with the street nickname given for some obscure reason of bronzer, and lived as poorly as a simple mujik in a little ancient cabin with only one room. And in this room lived he, Martha, the stove, a double bed, the coffins, a joiner's bench, and all the domestic utensils. Yet Jakob made admirable coffins, durable and good. For mujiks and petty tradespeople, he made them all of one size, taking himself as model. And this method never failed him, for though he was seventy years of age, there was not a taller or stouter man in the town, not even in the prison. For women and for men of good birth, he made his coffins to measure, using for this purpose an iron yard wand. Orders for children's coffins he accepted very unwillingly, made them without measurement, as if in contempt, and every time when paid for his work exclaimed, Thanks, but I confess I don't care much for wasting time on trifles. In addition to coffin-making, Jakob drew a small income from his skill with the fiddle. At weddings in the town, they usually played a Jewish orchestra, the conductor of which was the tinsmith Moses Hitch Shakes, who kept more than half the takings for himself. As Jacob played very well upon the fiddle, being particularly skillful with Russian songs, Shakes sometimes employed him in the orchestra, paying him fifty kopecks a day, exclusive of gifts from the guests. When Bronzer sat in the orchestra, he perspired and his face grew purple. It was always hot, the smell of garlic was suffocating. The fiddle whined, and his right ear snored the double bass, and his left wept the flute, played by a lanky, red-haired Jew with a whole network of red and blue veins upon his face, who bore the same surname as the famous millionaire Rothschild. And even the merriest tunes this accursed Jew managed to play sadly. Without any tangible cause, Jacob had become slowly penetrated with hatred and contempt for Jews, and especially for Rothschild. He began with irritation, then swore at him, and once even was about to hit him. But Rothschild flared up, and looking at him furiously said, If it were not that I respect you for your talents, I should send you flying out of the window. Then he began to cry. So Bronzer was employed in the orchestra very seldom, and only in cases of extreme need when one of the Jews was absent. Jacob had never been in a good humour. He was always overwhelmed by the sense of the losses which he suffered. For instance, on Sundays and Saints' days it was a sin to work, Monday was a tiresome day, and so on. So that in one way or another there were about two hundred days in the year when he was compelled to sit with his hands idle. That was one loss. If anyone in the town got married without music, or if Shakes did not employ Jacob, that was another loss. The inspector of police was ill for two years, and Jacob waited with impatience for his death, yet in the end the inspector transferred himself to the government town for the purpose of treatment, where he got worse and died. There was another loss a loss at the very least of ten roubles, as the inspector's coffin would have been an expensive one lined with brocade. Regrets for his losses generally overtook Jacob at night. He lay in bed with the fiddle beside him, and with his head full of such speculations, would take the bow, the fiddle giving out through the darkness a melancholy sound which made Jacob feel better. On the 6th of May last year, Martha was suddenly taken ill. She breathed heavily, drank much water, and staggered. Yet next morning she lighted the stove, and even went for water. Towards evening she lay down. All day Jacob had played on the fiddle, and when it grew dark he took the book in which every day he inscribed his losses, and from want of something better to do began to add them up. The total amounted to more than a thousand roubles. The thought of such losses so horrified him that he threw the book on the floor and stamped his feet. Then he took up the book, snapped his fingers, and sighed heavily. 
His face was purple and wet with perspiration. He reflected that if this thousand roubles had been lodged in the bank, the interest per annum would have amounted to at least forty roubles. That meant that the forty roubles were also a loss. In one word, whenever you turn, everywhere you meet with loss, and profits none. Jacob, cried Marfa unexpectedly, I am dying. He glanced at his wife. Her face was red from fever and unusually clear and joyful, and Bronzer, who was accustomed to see her pale, timid and unhappy looking, felt confused. It seemed as if she were indeed dying and were happy in the knowledge that she was leaving forever the cabin, the coffins and Jacob. And now she looked at the ceiling and twitched her lips as if she had seen death her deliverer and were whispering with him. Morning came, through the window might be seen the rising of the sun. Looking at his old wife, Jacob somehow remembered that all his life he had never treated her kindly, never caressed her, never pitied her, never thought of buying her a kerchief for her head, never carried away from the weddings a piece of tasty food, but only roared at her, abused her for his losses, and rushed at her with shut fists. True, he had never beaten her, but he had often frightened her out of her life and left her rooted to the ground with terror. Yes, and he had forbidden her to drink tea, as the losses without that were great enough, so she drank always hot water. And now, beginning to understand why she had such a strange, enraptured face, he felt uncomfortable. When the sun had risen high, he borrowed a cart from a neighbour and brought Martha to the hospital. There were not many patients there, and he had to wait only three hours. To his joy, he was received not by the doctor, but by the felcher, Maxim Nikolaitch, an old man of whom it was said that, although he was drunken and quarrelsome, he knew more than the doctor. May your health be good, said Jacob, leading the old woman into the dispensary. Forgive me, Maxim Nikolaitch, for troubling you with my empty affairs. But there, you can see for yourself, my object is ill. The companion of my life, as they say, excuse the expression. Contracting his grey brows and smoothing his whiskers, the felcher began to examine the old woman, who sat on the tabouret, bent, skinny, sharp-nosed, and with open mouth, so that she resembled a bird that is about to drink. So, said the felcher slowly, and then sighed, influenza, and maybe a bit of a fever. There is typhus now in the town. What can I do? She is an old woman. Glory be to God. How old? Sixty-nine years, Maxim Nikolaitch. An old woman. It's high time for her. Of course, your remark is very just, said Jacob, smiling out of politeness and I am sincerely grateful for your kindness, but allow me to make one remark. Every insect is fond of life. The felcher replied in a tone which implied that upon him alone depended her life or death. I will tell you what you'll do, friend. Put on her head a cold compress and give her these powders twice a day, and goodbye to you. By the expression of the felcher's face, Jacob saw that it was a bad business and that no powders would make it any better. It was quite plain to him that Martha was beyond repair, and would assuredly die, if not today, then tomorrow. He touched the felcher on the arm, blinked his eyes, and said in a whisper, Yes, Maxim Nikolaitch, but you will let her blood. I have no time, no time, friend. Take your old woman, and God be with you. Do me this one kindness, implored Jacob. You yourself know that if she merely had her stomach out of order, or some internal organ wrong, then powders and mixtures would cure, but she is caught cold. In cases of cold, the first tiling is to bleed the patient. But the felcher had already called for the next patient, and into the dispensary came a peasant woman with a little boy. Be off, he said to Jacob with a frown. At least try the effect of leashes. I will pray God eternally for you. The felcher lost his temper and roared, not another word. Jacob also lost his temper and grew purple in the face, but he said nothing more and took Martha under his arm and led her out of the room. 
As soon as he had got her into the cart, he looked angrily and contemptuously at the hospital and said, What an artist! He will let the blood of a rich man, but for a poor man grudges even a leech. Herod! When they arrived home and entered the cabin, Martha stood for a moment holding on to the stove. She was afraid that if she were to lie down, Jacob would begin to complain about his losses and abuse her for lying in bed and doing no work. And Jacob looked at her with tedium in his soul and remembered that tomorrow was John the Baptist and the day after Nikolai the miracle worker and then came Sunday and after that Monday another idle day. For four days no work could be done and Martha would be sure to die on one of these days. Her coffin must be made today. He took the iron yard wand, went up to the old woman and took her measure. After that she lay down and Jacob crossed himself and began to make a coffin. When the work was finished, Bronzer put on his spectacles and wrote in his book of losses, Martha Ivanova's coffin, two rubles, forty kopecks. And he sighed. All the time, Martha had lain silently with her eyes closed. Towards evening, when it was growing dark, she called her husband. Rememberest, Jacob, she said, looking at him joyfully. Rememberest, fifty years ago, God gave us a baby with yellow hair. Thou and I then sat every day by the river, under the willow, and sang songs. And laughing bitterly, she added, The child died. That is all imagination, said Jacob. Later on came the priest, administered to Martha the sacrament and extreme unction. Martha began to mutter something incomprehensible and towards morning died. The old women neighbors washed her, wrapped her in her winding sheet and laid her out. To avoid having to pay the deacon's fee, Jacob himself read the Psalms and escaped a fee also at the graveyard as the watchman there was his godfather. Four peasants carried the coffin free, out of respect for the deceased. After the coffin walked a procession of old women, beggars, and two cripples. The peasants on the road crossed themselves piously, and Jacob was very satisfied that everything passed off in honor, order, and cheapness, without offense to anyone. When saying goodbye for the last time to Martha, he tapped the coffin with his fingers and thought, an excellent piece of work. But while he was returning from the graveyard, he was overcome with extreme weariness. He felt unwell, he breathed feverishly and heavily, he could hardly stand on his feet. His brain was full of unaccustomed thoughts. He remembered again that he had never taken pity on Martha and never caressed her. The fifty-two years during which they had lived in the same cabin stretched back to eternity, yet in the whole of that eternity he had never thought of her never paid any attention to her, but treated her as if she were a cat or a dog. Yet every day she had lighted the stove, boiled and baked, fetched water, chopped wood, slept with him on the same bed, and when he returned drunk from weddings, she had taken his fiddle respectfully and hung it on the wall and put him to bed, all this silently with a timid, worried expression on her face. And now he felt that he could take pity on her, and would like to buy her a present, but it was too late. Towards Jacob, smiling and bowing, came Rothschild. I was looking for you, uncle, he said. Moses Illich sends his compliments and asks you to come across to him at once. Jacob felt inclined to cry. Begone, he shouted, and continued his path. You can't mean that, cried Rothschild in alarm, running after him. Moses Hitch will take offence. He wants you at once. The way in which the Jew puffed and blinked and the multitude of his red freckles awoke in Jacob disgust. He felt disgust, too, for his green frock coat with its black patches and his whole fragile, delicate figure. What do you mean by coming after me, Garlic? he shouted. Keep off! The Jew also grew angry and cried, If you don't take care to be a little politer, I will send you flying over the fence. Out of my sight, roared Jacob, rushing on him with clenched fists. Out of my sight, abortion, or I will beat the soul out of your cursed body. I have no peace with Jews. 
Rothschild was frozen with terror. He squatted down and waved his arms above his head as if warding off blows and then jumped up and ran for his life. While running, he hopped and flourished his hands and the twitching of his long, fleshless spine could plainly be seen. The boys in the street were delighted with the incident and rushed after him, crying, Jew! Jew! The dogs pursued him with loud barks. Someone laughed, then someone whistled, and the dogs barked louder and louder. Then, it must have been, a dog bit Rothschild, for there rang out a sickly, despairing cry. Jacob walked past the common and then along the outskirts of the town, and the street boys cried, Bronzer! Bronzer! With a piping note, snipe flew around him and ducks quacked. The sun baked everything, and from the water came scintillation so bright that it was painful to look at. Jacob walked along the path by the side of the river and watched a stout, red-cheeked lady come out of the bathing place. Not far from the bathing place sat a group of boys catching crabs with meat, and seeing him they cried maliciously, Bronza, Bronza! And at this moment before him rose a thick old willow with an immense hollow in it, and on it a raven's nest. And suddenly, in Jacob's mind, awoke the memory of the child with the yellow hair of whom Martha had spoken. Yes, it was the same willow, green, silent, sad, how it had aged, poor thing. He sat underneath it and began to remember. On the other bank, where was now a flooded meadow, there then stood a great birch forest, and farther away, where the now bare hill glimmered on the horizon, was an old pine wood. Up and down the river went barges, but now everything was flat and smooth. On the opposite bank stood only a single birch, young and shapely, like a girl, and on the river were only ducks and geese, where once had floated barges. It seemed that since those days, even the geese had become smaller. Jacob closed his eyes, and in imagination saw flying towards him an immense flock of white geese. He began to wonder how it was that in the last forty or fifty years of his life he had never been near the river, or if he had, had never noticed it. Yet it was a respectable river, and by no means contemptible. It would have been possible to fish in it, and the fish might have been sold to tradesmen, officials, and the attendant at the railway station buffet, and the money could have been lodged in the bank. He might have used it for rowing from country house to country house and playing on the fiddle, and everyone would have paid him money. He might even have tried to act as bargy. It would have been better than making coffins. He might have kept geese, killed them, and sent them to Moscow in the winter time. From the feathers alone, he would have made as much as ten roubles a year. But he had yawned away his life and done nothing. What losses! Ah, what losses! And if he had done altogether, caught fish, played on the fiddle, acted as bargy and kept geese, what a sum he would have amassed! But he had never even dreamed of this. Life had passed without profits, without any satisfaction. Everything had passed away unnoticed. Before him, nothing remained. But look backward, nothing but losses, such losses that to think of them, it makes the blood run cold. And why cannot a man live without these losses? Why had the birch wood and the pine forest both been cut down? Why is the common pasture unused? Why do people do exactly what they ought not to do? Why did he all his life scream, roar, clench his fists, insult his wife? For what imaginable purpose did he frighten and insult the Jew? Why, indeed, do people prevent one another living in peace? All these are also losses, terrible losses. If it were not for hatred and malice, people would draw from one another incalculable profits. Evening and night twinkled in Jacob's brain the willow, the fish, the dead geese, Martha with her profile like that of a bird about to drink, the pale, pitiable face of Rothschild, and an army of snouts thrusting themselves out of the darkness and muttering about losses. He shifted from side to side, and five times in the night rose from his bed and played on the fiddle. In the morning he rose with an effort and went to the hospital. 
The same Maxim Nikolaitch ordered him to bind his head with a cold compress and gave him powders, and by the expression of his face and by his tone, Yakob saw that it was a bad business and that no powders would make it any better. But upon his way home, he reflected that from death at least there would be one profit. It would no longer be necessary to eat, to drink, to pay taxes, or to injure others. And as a man lies in his grave not one year, but hundreds and thousands of years, the profit was enormous. The life of man was, in short, a loss, and only his death a profit. Yet this consideration, though entirely just, was offensive and bitter. For why in this world is it so ordered that life, which is given to a man only once, passes by without profit? He did not regret dying, but as soon as he arrived home and saw his fiddle, his heart fell, and he felt sorry. The fiddle could not be taken to the grave. It must remain an orphan, and the same thing would happen with it as had happened with the birch wood and the pine forest. Everything in this world decayed and would decay. Jacob went to the door of the hut and sat upon the threshold stone, pressing his fiddle to his shoulder. Still thinking of life, full of decay and full of losses, he began to play, and as the tune poured out plaintively and touchingly, the tears flowed down his cheeks, and the harder he thought, the sadder was the song of the fiddle. The latch creaked twice, and in the wicket door appeared Rothschild. The first half of the yard he crossed boldly, but seeing Jacob, he stopped short, shriveled up, and apparently from fright began to make signs as if he wished to tell the time with his fingers. Come on, don't be afraid, said Jacob kindly, beckoning him. Come! With a look of distrust and terror, Rothschild drew near and stopped about two yards away. Don't beat me, Jacob, it is not my fault, he said with a bow. Moses Hitch has sent me again. Don't be afraid, he said. Go to Jacob again and tell him that without him we cannot possibly get on. The wedding is on Wednesday. Shapovalov's daughter is marrying a wealthy man. It will be a first-class wedding, added the Jew, blinking one eye. I cannot go, answered Jacob, breathing heavily. I am ill, brother. And again he took his bow, and the tears burst from his eyes and fell upon the fiddle. Rothschild listened attentively, standing by his side with arms folded upon his chest. The distrustful, terrified expression upon his face little by little changed into a look of suffering and grief. He rolled his eyes as if in an ecstasy of torment and ejaculated, Watch! And the tears slowly rolled down his cheeks and made little black patches on his green frock coat. All day long, Jacob lay in bed and worried. With evening came the priest, and confessing him, asked whether he had any particular sin which he would like to confess. And Jacob exerted his fading memory, and remembering Martha's unhappy face, and the Jew's despairing cry when he was bitten by the dog, said in a hardly audible voice, Give the fiddle to Rothschild. And now in the town everyone asks, where did Rothschild get such an excellent fiddle? Did he buy it, or steal it, or did he get it in pledge? Long ago he abandoned his flute, and now plays on the fiddle only. From beneath his bow issue the same mournful sounds as formerly came from the flute, but when he tries to repeat the tune that Jacob played when he sat on the threshold stone, the fiddle emits sounds so passionately sad and full of grief that the listeners weep, and he himself rolls his eyes and ejaculates, Watch! But this new song so pleases everyone in the town that wealthy traders and officials never fail to engage Rothschild for their social gatherings and even force him to play it as many as ten times. <laughs>